though, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand says that she is in for 2020, and Senator Sherrod Brown says that he may be. The Democratic field just keeps growing, growing. Meanwhile, the Women's March has run into some problems in the run-up to the march that is happening this weekend. And finally, how do you feel about a very high tax rate on the wealthy? The so, answer of the American public might surprise you, Sagar. <laughs> Team Rising is here to tap into all those subjects. Anisha Singh is a senior organizing director at the Center for American Progress. And Maddie Dupler is the founder and president of Forward Strategies and a senior fellow of fiscal policy at the National Taxpayers Union. Maddie and Anisha, welcome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So this is a Maddie Duffler special. <laughs> yeah. When I saw you're the Talk tax me. lady, yeah. and I was like, we got this poll. We yeah. got to put it to Maddie and also to Anisha. Um, OK, so Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez made a lot of heads explode when she suggested in a lengthy interview that for the marginal tax rate over, say, $10 million, mm -hmm. so we're talking, in her words, the tippy-tippy top mm -hmm. of the income scale. That's a technical term, by the tippy -tippy way. Tippy-tippy yeah. top. Yeah. does define. Yes. <laughs> so that she would support raising taxes that to a level of, say, 70%. And mm -hmm. she wasn't really super specific, but 70% was the number that she floated over $10 million. Heads exploded. Many articles were written. She doesn't know anything. This would be just destroy the economy. She's terrible, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well, turns out, American people, 59%, agree with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mm -hmm. on this. Well, and I'm not surprised by these results. I suspect it would be a lot lower if the truth about what a 70% marginal tax rate does was actually included in that poll. And what right. I mean by that is that it doesn't actually raise any money. I think we know from a lot of polling that Americans generally think that we need to put more revenue into the government to make things work. Mm -hmm. Shutdown being what it is right now, that seems to be a thesis that people are willing to accept. Um, but the problem with the 70% marginal tax rate, when we had our high marginal tax rates in the 50s and 60s, the point is that no one paid them. And in fact, we take in more federal income tax revenue now than we did at that point for that reason. It was easy to avoid. And not only was it easy to avoid, we had a tiny, tiny tax base. I mean, you could basically deduct this table just by sitting at it. And so no one was paying those tax rates. So I, the problem that I have with the Congresswoman is not that she decides that she wants a higher tax rate than I think is efficient for the economy. It's that she's not saying, she's not giving people the full picture, which is when she talks about a new green deal or Medicare for all or extremely costly programs, she's not actually giving an answer on how to pay for them because a high marginal tax rate is not the way to do Maddie, it. Maddie, that is such an excellent point because you see in countries with massive tax rates on the rich is that it ends up just being an all cash black market economy and the top line figures are all basically fake and the government right. doesn't actually know and how much money that its own economy is generating. Exactly. And we yeah. need to stop pretending that the income tax rate is where the money comes from. Yeah. The reason that I think this is so disingenuous for the left to say that income tax is the way to pay for these new spending programs is it's not the way it's done in these European countries. These European countries have value added taxes, which are consumption taxes, which are actually extremely regressive because, of course, if you are someone who makes less money, a higher uh, portion of your income goes to paying for those taxes taxes when you're buying a product. Yeah. Anisha, I think a lot is being read into how this would be implemented, who it would affect, how it would be handled. But the reality is, during the 50s and 60s, when we did have these very high levels, it was also a period of incredible sustained prosperity in American history. That's exactly right. You know, over the last 60, 70 years, we've seen tax rates as high as 92 percent, and we've seen high growth. And so that's, I think, what, what some people are talking about. That's what AOC is talking about. Um, and that's what American people are looking at right now. They're trying to see, how can I get more, po more money in my pocket? It and, and, you know, how can we make this more fair? And so that's why we're seeing these polling results right now. And I just think that I would point to once again, when we had that tax rate of 92%, you can count on two hands the number of people yeah. who paid it. Eight people paid it in 1960. So it is clearly not the way to fund new massive incursions of government spending. It's simply unsustainable. Well, and we don't have a lot of people now paying. I mean, the wealthy have all kinds of loopholes. They usually pay less Absolutely. than, you know, Warren Buffett paying less and than the his wealthy, secretary, for right. example, which is something that very much needs to be fixed. Um, Anisha, I want to get your thoughts, though, on Kirsten Gillibrand, senator from New York, um, jumping into the presidential race. She initially got elected as a congresswoman for a pretty rural conservative district in upstate New York. She was fairly conservative on some measures then. Then she ended up, um, you know, as senator, and her, her positions have changed over time. Now she is one of the most progressive voting records in the Senate. What do you think of her chances here in this uh, wide Democratic primary field? It's exciting. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about this morning is, you know, we have a younger generation right now that is watching, you know, a slew of women come forward and run for office, and that's amazing. But yeah. whether you're talking about 
her. You're talking about Warren, you know, um, Tulsi. Uh, Tulsi. You're talking about uh, Harris, potentially, and others that might come out. Uh, we have a, a slew of women coming out and, and uh, running for office, which changes the game. Um, I think Gillibrand herself will challenge other candidates to talk more about women's rights, to talk more about women's empowerment, empowerment um, which is all good things. Do you think that her progressivism is real, though? I mean, you've seen somebody who was an immigration restrictionist and almost sounded like Donald Trump she had an almost F 10 the, years ago. She had an A from the NRA. And, and yeah, I mean, we're, this is, I mean, and then you've seen a complete and utter shift to be basically become the embodiment of the editorial page over at the New York Times. Is that somebody who you can really trust with actual, you know, progressive credentials and as the progressive candidate in this race, especially when you have so many others that are, have been leftists really since the beginning of their careers? I think she has she has shifted, but it's it's all for the good, and she is trying her best to be a, a, a candidate for women, for people of color, for the Democratic Party. Um, she is going, like she said, living room to living room, talking to women, trying to understand the issues that Im are impacting women across the country, and taking that to heart here. Um, and I think that's important. And her record right now, she has voted against a lot of Trump's nominees, if not all of them, I believe. She has um, the most anti-Trump mm -hmm. voting record I Absolutely. saw in, in the Senate. So I mean that, and I'm sure she will be sure to tell that. Um, Maddie, I want to get your thoughts on both Kirsten, but also um, Sherrod Brown, mm -hmm. senator from Ohio. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of like populist working class cred. He yep. won easily in a state that really has been trending away from Democrats, but obviously is still a pivotal swing state. Mm -hmm. He has announced his dignity of work tour, or whatever <laughs> yeah. that is, which just <laughs> happens to be going to it's, Iowa, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, <laughs> South Carolina, yeah. and Nevada, which huh. is really an interesting coincidence. Yeah, imagine that. Well, <laughs> I think you hit on it when you mentioned the voting record, the NRA record of Kristen Gillibrand, the question, and the anti-Trump record of, anti of Kristen Gillibrand as well. The question is whether or not Democrats need to nominate someone who is an anti-Trump force or if it's someone who casts a wide net and, and, wide net and expands who Democrats are willing to support uh, in the general. To me, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I think that certainly there will be a multitude of candidates to choose from. Mm -hmm. Sharon Brown, I think, is a good example of someone who's really going to make that cleavage clear because he's a pretty typical politician, uh, Midwestern white guy, so not super excitable for that reason. Uh, he's got but a cool voice. He's got a cool voice, but like everyone, but when he, he can't comb his hair. When, right? Right? Yeah. When, when people start talking about Sharon Brown, everyone's like, Wait, really? Like, is yeah. that a real thing? So when you miss the excitement factor, I think that's certainly going to be mm -hmm. something Democrats are considering. Mm -hmm. When you have energetic candidates like a Kamala Harris, Beto, of course, is always kind of the He's the on a road trip, which is yeah, yeah, somehow yeah. worse than being on a dignity of work trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, what, what is it that breaks through? I will tell you, as a Republican who watched this yeah. in 2016, when we had everyone under the sun running for president, it doesn't necessarily mean that the strongest candidate emerges because you have, <clears throat> you have a momentum question for mm -hmm. so many people and how long can that sustain itself? Here's, here's one thing I will say, Sagar, and then I'll mm -hmm. let you tee up the next topic here. But um, Kirsten Gillibrand, I, I know her and I've watched her over the years. And I, I do think she's going to have an authenticity issue. I think the fact that she was A from the NRA and now she's an F, I, I think those are going to be issues. But I will say she is very tough mm -hmm. and very smart. And she will be formidable because she is just relentlessly um, she's a fighter. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think you can say that about most of the Dem female yeah. candidates. I would certainly yeah, I think say that's that about right. most of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Anisha, I do want to uh, get your thoughts on this. You know, we have the Republican reckoning with Steve King. But, you know, right now we have the Women's March that has been disassociated with by the DNC, much because of many of its organizers' ties to anti-Semitism. Why is it that there is not a bigger push within the progressive movement in order to disassociate themselves from virulent anti-Semites and people who are anti-Israel. I think a lot of groups have come out and said we do not, uh, you know, approve of this anti-Semitism. Where is the House censure of Rashida Tlaib and of Ilan Omar and their comments on the state of Israel? And it basically, I mean, you have the organizer of the Women's March, one of the single most defining moments of the Democratic Party, who cannot come out against Louis Farrakhan and admit that the state of Israel has a right to exist. 
Why is it this not something that deserves its own house, uh, its own house censure and the loss of committee seats? The Women's March had such an impactful year last year and brought out women in a way that we haven't seen before, and it even resulted in a, a majority, you know, a, a record number of women in elected office. And I think that's what we're we're talking about here: is this Women's March? Yes, there are issues right now, but there is a lot of good that came out of the marches. Um, there are marchers that we want to uh, encourage to continue to be active and to continue to feel empowered um, and to feel, you know, like they can go out and march again if they need to and or take action in other ways. I think the Women's March, um, you know, in 2017 was the first step. And now we're seeing women come out uh, in full force, uh, taking action across it the has, board. And we need to make sure it has that had that a tremendous continues. impact. And and it pains me to say it because I've known I've actually known Tamika for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I am just absolutely floored at the way she, I mean, at the whole thing. And she goes on The View on Monday. Meghan McCain asks her flat out, will you condemn these remarks? And she won't do it. In my view, Maddie, she has to step aside from leadership of the Women's March. I mean, there is just, I just don't I see agree. any other way. This is completely unacceptable. I agree. And if you're going to be about all women mm -hmm. and promoting all women and intersectionality mm -hmm. and inclusion, which are supposed to be core founding principles mm -hmm. here, at this point, she is doing nothing but hindering the movement that she is supposed to care so much about. I absolutely agree with you. And I would disagree that the Women's March is about all women. I don't think that it's inclusive of people Absolutely. like me who are Republicans, conservatives. It's about progressive women. It's There's about progressive, no doubt about that. exactly. But yeah, that's I didn't my see point. any pro life women. I know, yeah, but that's my point. Right. It's okay yeah. to say that it's about progressive women, but don't pretend that it's about all women because it's not relatable to me at all. And, like, you know, I have free public affairs advice for the Women's March. <laughs> Rather than saying that empowerment dials down to wearing knitted genitalia on your head and marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., why don't you offer workshops that allow women the opportunity to learn how to negotiate a higher salary, that give women the opportunity and the tools to close the inequality gap, that actually get to some of the pervasive problems we have in this country? I disagree with the notion that having women enraged and then caught up in this cyclone of negative political rhetoric is helpful to the movement in general and the progressive movement well, in but I, will, but I will say, and Anisha, I'm sure you're going to say this too, I know personally many women who went to that march and then they said, F it, I'm running. Like mm -hmm. I never saw myself as a candidate, but I feel so empowered by this experience mm -hmm. that I'm going to do it. And some of those women are now members of Congress. Absolutely. And there's also trainings that do happen the day before the Women's March each year um, and throughout the year after that as well to train women on tools and resources. I think all of that is active. great. But if the movement itself is tied to people who are so but you I know, think just, you can't you can't punish the the marchers and the movement itself absolutely. because of its leaders. I, right? Absolutely, Mallory but, needs to step aside. Yeah, and it, but it's not just Tamika. It really right. is. It seems to me embedded within the new progressive movement of a strain of anti-Semitism, which is just never discussed in the public square because it's a taboo subject. Well, and I think that the DNC, the AFL-CIO, I believe, mm -hmm. all of these other big organizations that have stepped away from the Women's March need to right. explain why they have done so. If it is indeed a powerhouse, as you were suggesting, for progressive women, then I would think that it would be suspect that all of these big Democratic establishments now don't want fingerprints on it. Yeah. Well, I think until you have Tamika in particular step aside, I think that it's going to be toxic for a yeah. lot of large organizations, and certainly Absolutely. officially the Democratic Party, which we saw step away yesterday. Um, ladies, thank you. Thanks, Appreciate guys. you being Thank you. A judge deems a question off limits for the U.S. Census, and IRS workers are returning to the job, but still no pay for them. We'll talk about those stories and more when Rising continues.